Hi, for this session, I'm going to be talking about effective ways to maintain and scale up your web crawling project using Scrapey and its ecosystem of tools. Uh, but before we start, though, I just want to introduce myself really quickly here. So hi, I'm Kevin Lloyd Bernal, and I live in the Philippines. I currently work remotely as a software engineer in Zeit. Uh, if you're not familiar with Zeit, Zeit is uh, the leading maintainers of Scrapey, which is the tool and its ecosystem of tools, which I'm going to be talking about later. I also currently take a master's in computer science at Georgia Tech, um, and here are some of my social links. Right, so for this talk, uh, I want to introduce the objectives first. So we're going to be building a spider from scratch that crawls all of the books that could be found in this website right here. So it's books to scrape.com. Um, so we're going to be starting with a very basic spider and improve it along the way. And just a quick disclaimer here. Uh, we at Zite maintain this uh, website domain, and then we just use it to, you know, practice uh, crawling or test out some of our tools uh, against our own uh, website. Um, for this talk, we're going to be using, as I mentioned, Scrapey and its ecosystem of tools. Uh, we'll also discuss the tools that you might want to use as you scale up your project. Um, we're using Scrapey here because we want to em emphasize uh, crawling and extraction at scale. We could use, you know, beautiful soup or the plain old request library in Python for basic web data extraction, but it doesn't really provide a rich ecosystem uh, when you need to scale. Um, yeah, as a disclaimer, I work inside uh, the organization that develops and maintains Scrapey amongst other tools in its own ecosystem. So most of the tools and concepts that I would be discussing in this talk revolves around my day-to-day -day work at Zite. So first off, uh, the why. So why am I talking about this topic or rather why learn crawling web data extraction? So right now, data is at the very core of every data-driven business. For example, we collect a lot of data between prices or products or articles. So having the right skills and knowledge regarding how to retrieve the information uh, in the web is a really, really valuable skill. It would also complement a lot of the skills uh, like data analysis, uh, because if you're able to retrieve any type of web data that, that is currently available at your fingertips right now in the web, then you know that would really augment the data sets that you could have. But before we write off our basic spider, just want to clarify some terms here. So the first term I want to discuss would be the seed URL. So this is simply the entry point at where our crawl begins. It could be a homepage, it could be a listing page of products or articles. It's just the beginning link wherein it's the first type of web page that our spider uh, requests in the web. And I also want to emphasize the difference between crawling and extraction uh, because we're going to be using these terms quite a lot there uh, later on. So crawling is the act of visiting a website from page to page. And extraction is just actually parsing the data from a given page. So one could think that, you know, they are interchangeable, but in crawling, you're not exactly you know extracting anything you're just trying to decide what to crawl next from you know your given uh, web page that you are right now but yeah we're going to be uh, discussing or rather exploring the differences between this one these two terms later and for the extraction we have different types of rules to perform extracting data from a given uh, web page for example, CSS rules, if you're a web developer, this is really, really natural to you. And XPath rules, it contains a lot more features for traversing HTML documents, but could be a bit more complex. Uh, for this talk, we're going to be mostly using CSS rules, but I just want you to know that XPath rules is also there, uh, which contains a lot more features. Um, for example, you could traverse a doc, uh, I mean, a node in the DOM uh, backwards. Uh, as opposed to CSS rules, which uh, doesn't really offer that one. So here's are some 
quick examples of how the rules differ from each other. Um, they're pointing or rather extracting the same data or text from the same web page element. So for the CSS rule, you would see that we have a ULL, UL tag here with an ID equals main and another LI tag with a class of data and it's you know the second nth child. And we're just extracting the text. But if you try to compare this one with the XPath rule, the XPaths tend to be more verbose. As you would see here, we're getting, we're, we're actually defining the ID equals main and then class data, um, and then the second child. So they just point to the same thing, uh, but yeah, there's some key differences there. Right, so with those definitions in mind, I think we're ready to write our first uh, scrapey spider. And I just also want you to know that all of the code that you would see here could be found in this uh, bit.ly link right here, so you could check them out uh, after the session. So the first thing we're, we're, we're gonna be doing is pip install scrapey, install it in our virtual environment, and we're gonna be starting a project using this command right here. So first off, let's open up a terminal here. I have in a directory named PyCon. I'm gonna create a virtual environment. Uh, let's call it Python, PyCon APAC. And I'm gonna be activating that environment and doing a pip install scrapey. Um, and we're gonna be using this command right here uh, to generate the scrapey directory that you know use uh, could be used as a template. There we go. Uh, scrapey is now installed, so I'm gonna be doing scrapey uh, start project. You could see the list of com uh, usage commands here, so I'm just gonna name it books to scrape. And as you can see, if I check out the directory, it's created these uh, directory structure right here. What we want to do here is to go into the project that is created. It's named book to scrape And we're going to be creating our own spider using this gen spider command here. Just to give you a quick overview of what the command is about. So the first parameter is the name of the spider and then the domain. So we're going to be naming it books. That's the spider name. And we're going to be crawling books to script.com. And now if I check out the directory again, you would see that there's a spider named booked here. So we're going to be opening up that books spider. And as you can see, this is a really quick template. Um, it's naming it books, the spider's name books, as we've seen earlier. And it's allowed domain is books to scrape.com. Allowed domains here means that if the spider sees a link that is outside of this domain, it's not going to, you know, crawl that one. And of course, the start URLs is, this is just the seed URL that we've talked about earlier. So our spider would crawl this uh, web page first. So let's discuss the flow of how our spider would work. So we'd first begin at this seed URL, books to scrape.com, and it's going to be extracting all of the books from this page. Uh, there's, so there's like 20 books available just on the homepage alone. And we're going to be storing the extracted data locally in a JSON lines file. We're able to do that one by providing this argument, uh, data.jl using this uh, dash o or output uh, flag right here. And to run the scrapey spider, it's just going to be scrapey crawl books. And just to give you an overview of what the books to scrape.com looks like. So let's first visit it here, books to scrape.com. This contains exactly a thousand books and as we mentioned, we're just going to be, at least for the first part, we're going to be extracting all the books here from the home page. So there's like 20 of them, right? So each of these books we're going to be extracting. So one of the ways we could easily, you know, determine how to extract or define the extraction rules in this particular web page or any type of web page that you want to crawl, uh, we could go to the inspect tab or view, 
in Chrome DevTools. Um, and you could just inspect the link for this book right here. So you would see uh, that it's, it's an article with a class of product pod. So we can start with, so let's define product pod. We want, we're pretty much interested in this link right here. So this a anchor tag, right? So we're going to be defining that one and we're going to be extracting the href. So the href is this link right here, which actually points to the book itself. So if we're going to be opening this one, it would point to the actual book. So this is, this is just our plain old CSS rule that we're going to be defining. So let's go back to our terminal and define that one. So we could say something like for URL, but so the first two lines that we've defined here actually just retrieves all of the links or URLs for each of the books in the given web page, right? So we've defined it using the CSS rule. The adders tag is just, uh, or the adders function for, for the CSS rule simply mentions that we want to extract the href attribute for the given anchor tag right here. So that gives us the actual link for the book and, and we're looping them over here and we're going to be yielding this expression, a response dot follow URL. Uh, we're using follow here because if you recall, the links are not absolute, like they don't contain, you know, the full URL, like HTTPS books it just starts with a catalog right here. So in order for our spider to actually, you know, determine, uh, or rather connect to the correct domain, we're going to be using, uh, this response to, to follow here because the response instance here contains the context, uh, for the given web page, uh, which is, you know, the, the homepage that we have. And then the next parameter is self that parse book, which we haven't defined yet, uh, which we're going to be defining now. Um, and it's responsible for actually extracting the data that we might want to have to retrieve from the website. So let's define those, uh, data. So the first data I'd say is the title. So we want to extract this one. We also want to extract the price and we also want to store the URL here. Um, and let's say we also want to extract this availability, uh, tag here. So first let's define the method. So the first data that we want to extract is the title. So we could go back into Chrome and inspect the element for this one. So you would see it's in a class named product main and it's inside an H1 tag. And we want to extract the text from this H1 tag. So we're going to use column, uh, column, column text. And to extract this one, we want to uh, use the expression, uh, response that CSS and then the extraction rule and then dot get. The next type of data that we want to extract would be the price. So we could go here for the price and it has this price color instead of H1 tag. So we're going to be using that one. So you would see it works great from the Chrome dev tools. So let's define that one. The next would be the URL. So to access the URL, like this exact one, we're just going to be defining it as response that URL. And lastly, uh, we could just yield the item we could also return, but I think it's a good practice to define yield here because later on, uh, for the same web page, you may want to return multiple items at the same time. So it's, it's good to define this one as a generator rather than just, you know, return the item directly. Right. So I think we're ready to run this one. To run the spider, we're going to be using this command, scrapey crawl books dash o and data dot jl. After typing the command, just press enter and the spider would now run. As you would see, it's spitting out all the logs from the crawl uh, into the screen. And now it's finished here. As you could see in the last line log, 
And if you check out the stats, the stats are actually dumped here um, in this line, and it's presented in this dictionary, right? Um, if we try to inspect some of its data, you would actually see that it's scraped exactly 20 items, which is, you know, good because we wanted to extract all 20 items from the given web page. And you could also see that it stored the JSON lines file into this file right here. Now let's try to open up the output file to see what the data we've collected looks like. So as you would see here, each line is a JSON data. Um, so we have 20 of them, which represents 20 items. We've collected the title field. We've collected price, but it's null. So we need to fix that one soon. We've also collected the, the URL here. We've collected title, price, URL, all three of the fields that we want to collect. But let's first check out what went wrong with the price field here. To do that one, let's go back to our spider. And let's inspect the CSS rule that we've used for price. Uh, so you would notice here that I'm missing a dot here for the price color because we're not actually interested in a HTML tag named price color. We're interested in a class named price color. So we need to add a tag here. And just to review, let's go back to the website. So you would see here, this is the price color that uh, we misrepresented in a rule because it should be a class, right? Now let's try to rerun our spider, but first we need to delete the old data output file. Otherwise it would just append the new data in this existing file and run the spider. Now let's check out the new data output file. Hopefully everything is fixed now. Um, as you can see, yep, it's, it's now fixed. Um, there's some weird characters here though. Uh, we got uh, some Unicode characters here to represent the pound sign here. But if you check out the output from these creepy logs, it's actually denoting it correctly here. So just uh, a thing to note between, you know, the output file that you're getting from Scrapey uh, versus the items that are presented in the logs. Right, so I think that went well for our first uh, version of our spider. So let's try to check out other fields we might want to extract, which is a bit harder. So I think we could try to extract this one. So we could call it uh, a field named availability. And I think this is a field that is quite harder to do, mostly because of this nested I tag here. And the text that we want to actually extract is underneath this one. Uh, to demo how this one needs some pre-processing, uh, let's check out a PDB debugger. So let's insert a breakpoint statement here and try to run the spider. Now it's paused in the breakpoint statement in this specific code block. Um, and let's try to define the CSS rule for the availability field. So the data that we actually want to extract is available from this P tag right here uh, with a class named availability. Um, and it's under this div node right here with a class named product main. So we could actually try to extract the one in our breakpoint. And let's try to extract it using the dot get method that we've used earlier for the other fields. And as you would see, it's actually returning a new line and a bunch of uh, white spaces here. And that's mostly because of how the node is being presented in the DOM, wherein the text that we actually want to extract comes after this I tag right here. To alleviate that one, what we actually want to do is try to extract all of the text underneath this P tag. We could do that one by using the dot get all method instead of dot get. Now it returns a list of strings containing the substring that we're actually interested in. To easily get rid of the white spaces, we could just combine these together. And strip the white spaces. And now the data is clean and good to go. Now we could simply copy portions of this code into our spider.
And now let's try to run our spider again. And check out the data that we've collected. Now you would see it's still the same 20 items, but now we have this availability field here. So that's it for the first spider flow that we try to run. Um, let's make it a bit harder, wherein we're gonna be exploring all of the categories in the sidebar instead of just extracting the books that we could see in the homepage. So we're not gonna be doing that anymore. Uh, we're gonna check out each category in the sidebar, extract all of the books from the given category, um, as well as paginate each book from you know a list of categories. So let's try to check out the website again to see what this structure is. So this is the homepage where we've successfully extracted 20 of the available books here. What we want to do is explore each of the categories here. For example, let's check out uh, historical fiction and sequential art. Each of this one, each category contains 20 books and we're able to paginate you know, here from page one to page two by clicking next. Uh, for sequential art, there's like 75 results. So there's about no, there's exactly four paginations that we need to do. Let's write out a spider that would actually crawl using this flow. First, let's go back to the home page here and let's try to inspect the category elements here to create the CSS rules for our spider. So as you can see, each of the links here are inside these li tags and each li tag has an anchor tag underneath. What we're really interested in are the href data from each of the eight anchor tags. We could do this one by first defining that we could start in this UL with a class named navList, and let's traverse into the li tags and into the anchor tags. Now, into our spider, we wanna replace this two lines here because these are extracting the book links instead of the category links. Now, if you would notice, it's pretty much the same thing as extracting all of the book links here, but the only changes are the CSS rules, which are pretty much different, as well as the callbacks. For the callbacks, we're gonna be defining, or rather moving this code block into parse category. So now the flow goes like this one. First, the spider goes to the home page using the seed URL, and it would call the parse method. And the parse method actually extracts all of the category links in the sidebar and pass that one into the parse category method. The parse category method would now check out all of the book URLs found in each of the category. Each book URL found in the given category is then passed into this parse book method. Uh, we're not going to be changing this one for now. There's one thing missing here though, wherein for each of the category page, we're not you know, defining yet the pagination for the next page. So let's define that one next. So let's go back to the website and try to find a category with a next page. This one looks good. So we need to inspect the next page element here. As you would see, it's just underneath this li tag, and we could just use this class name named next. Now the pagination is complete. If you notice, we're doing an if statement here because not all of the pages have a next page, so we need to handle those edge case. Now let's try to run this first. Just try to see if you know we encountered any problems from our recent refactors. Uh, 
And yes, now it's spitting out an error wherein URL is not defined on line 11. So let's try to debug that one. And it's pretty much because we've renamed URL into a category URL here. And let's also try to define this one as book URL to keep things more organized. I also notice a small bug here wherein we're paginating the next page in the homepage itself instead of paginating for each type of category. So what we need to do is just simply move this if block into the right. So it's actually underneath the for loop here. There's also this tricky situation or edge case really uh, in this website that I want to emphasize. So for our rule here, we're defining the UL with a class of nav list and then checking out all of the list tags and anchor tags underneath it. But if we try to check out the website itself, you'd actually see that the UL with a class named nav list also has this UL tag underneath. And just before that one, there's this A tag that we wanna avoid, right? So in order to avoid this one, we want to simply define that the LI tags that we wanna crawl are these guys here, and it completely ignore this one right here. And to do that one, what we could define as a CSS rule is define as the rule as ul dot nav list ul li and a the key word here is putting another ul tag just before the li tag so we could simply fix that one as adding an a ul tag here now i'll try to run this code Now it's run successfully. And if we try to check out the stats, it actually says that items scrape count equals a thousand. So let's check out the data output file. Now, if we try to scroll down to how many lines there is, there's exactly a thousand items that we've actually extracted. So that looks great. Now, suppose we want to update our spider wherein we want to associate each book from where we got it from, from which category. So for example, we want to associate that these books here came from a category named sequential art. So what we could do is determine the CSS rules on how to extract this one. So we could see that there's a div named uh, with a class named page header, and the data we want to extract is under this H1 tag. Now we could extract the category name by using that CSS rule. Now there's a tricky part to this where we want to pass the category name into the parse book. And we could simply define that one using the CB quarks, which looked like this one. And what this does is pass this dictionary as a callback arguments into the callback where we define parse book. So we also need to update uh, parse book to accept that callback. Now our parse book method accepts the category name uh, callback parameter. And we need to update the item to also add the category name here. Now let's try to run it to see if it's successful. Now it's finished also without any errors here because we only has debug and info logs. If there are errors or exceptions, it we would actually see them into the stats here. So let's open up the data file again. and it's extracted all 1,000 books. And now we have this category name. To recap, uh, in 34 lines of code, 
we've actually defined our spider to visit the seed URL, books.toscrape.com, and gather all of the category links on the sidebar. And for each category, find each of the books and paginate if there's a next page for the given category. We're parsing uh, title, price, URL, and availability in the book method for each book page. And we're also parsing the category for each category page and simply passing it to parse book. So all in all, our spider is basically jumping into three pages, the home page, category page, and then the book page. Now let's try to improve our simple spider. First, we may want to define the items. So I've linked out the official guide here because it contains a lot of different approaches you could take, wherein you could use Creepy's own item class to define items. You could also use Python's own data classes. And there's also third party libraries out there like the address library to define uh, data containers wherein it's defining you know, the fields where each item could hold. Um, it's much better to define the fields on each item rather than a dictionary because if you know, you're not allowing a given item to contain this particular field, it would error out. So it contains uh, some sort of validation where it only allows this type of fields to be present in a given item. Now, for this session, we're going to be using Python's own data class to define our items. To do that one, let's go back to our code. And if you notice, when we tried to run the scrapey start project command earlier, it, was, it created this boilerplate uh, project template for us. What we want to do is open up the items. And this is where we're going to be defining the items ourselves. Uh, it already contains some boilerplate code here uh, by defining uh, the items using item. But let's suppose we're not going to be using this one for now. We're going to be using uh, Python's own data classes. And now we've defined the items here. And if you notice, we're using type annotations to define that category name, title, price, availability are all optional, while URL is the only one required for our book item. Defining other fields as optional is pretty much uh, the best practice for web scraping, mostly because websites change every now and then wherein the parser rules that we've defined earlier could suddenly become stale. They're not working anymore. That means you're not actually extra extracting uh, the title, the price. And if that happens, your data for that given field uh, does not exist. So you may want to label them as optional. Otherwise, they would error out. In any case, URL is always present because it could be found in the context wherein the spider is currently at. We could access the URL by accessing the URL attribute in the response instance. Now let's try to use the book item in our spider. Now that we've imported it, we're simply going to be using it inside the parse book. Remember that item here is a dictionary and we want to expand that one to be parameters for the book item class. As usual, let's try to run this one. Now it's finished running and we'd actually see finish reason equals finished and there are no errors reported. Let's try to open up the data output file again. So it's the same data set that we've actually extracted earlier. Uh, there's no changes in the data because we haven't you know, added new fields. We haven't updated the extraction rules. We just tried to 
define the item and use this item when trying to return the book data that we've extracted. Now let's try to explore this in detail, the benefits of defining items beforehand. Now let's try to insert a breakpoint statement here and try to run our spider again. As you would see in this context here, if we try to check out the contents of the item, uh, we have the category name, title, price, URL, and availability. And if we try to insert that one in the book item, it's just actually returning an instance of the book item class containing those fields inside the item dictionary. Now let's suppose we want to introduce another field that is not present in the book item data class. Let's call it a known field. As you would see, the book item returns an error, uh, got unexpected keyword argument found unknown field. Defining items beforehand actually presents an advantage wherein developers are able to determine what are the actual fields needed for a given uh, website. In this case, if they try to insert an unknown field, as we've seen here, it would present an error. The same is also true if we're trying to define a book item that doesn't contain any of the required fields. For example, we're only passing title here. This would actually lead to an error as well, wherein its required argument URL uh, is missing. Remember that we've defined URL here as a required field as opposed to the other fields, uh, which uses the optional type annotation. There are quite a lot of different techniques um, you could use depending on your use case for using items. So I would encourage you to check out the official guide on defining items here and try to check out what are the um, actual useful techniques you could do for your own use case. For this improvement, we're introducing the concept of page objects. Page objects makes our code simpler because it decouples the, or rather hides the extraction logic away from it. So our spider could concentrate on crawling while page object simply takes care of data extraction. Let's check it out in more detail by installing the necessary dependencies. First, let's install WebPoet and ScrapyPoet. Now that it's installed, let's create a new module inside our Scrapey project here named page objects. And let's open up the file. Now we're going to be importing from WebPoet a class named item web page. Now let's try to revisit the spider code that we had earlier. To define our page object, what we're really interested in is trying to move this extraction logic into the page object itself. So our spider doesn't care about, you know, how do, how do we extract a title field? How do we extract a price field? What are the extraction rules given? To do that, let's create a subclass of item web page named book page. The item web page contains an abstract method named toItem, which we need to define. We would be calling the toItem method later on to retrieve all of the uh, data contained in the book page. First, let's copy all of the extraction logic from the spider. One thing to note here is we don't have access to the response instance or variable anymore, but we could simply replace this one with self because it's already available inside the page object itself. You would also notice that the category name is not available inside the page object itself because the page object is not extracting the category name, but rather it's simply receiving the category name data from the parse book. 
Now that we've defined the page object, how do we actually integrate this one into our Scrapey project? In our slides, we could see the links to the official guides to WebPoet and ScrapyPoet. WebPoet implements the page object pattern for web scraping. This is where we actually imported the item web page class where we used as a parent class for our book page. To integrate this one to Scrapey, we need ScrapyPoet. If we check out its official docs, we need to go into the basic tutorial and check out how to configure the project inside Scrapey. If you notice, we need to enable its middleware inside the settings.py in the Scrapey project. So what we need to do is copy this one, open up our settings.py in our project, and paste it at the bottom. This allows us to use the page objects inside our Scrapey project as something like If you notice, we're introducing another parameter for a parsebook named page, and we're annotating it with the class of book page. When ScrapyPoet sees this one, it's able to identify that parsebook needs the page object named book page. In this case, it's simply passing an instance of the book page into the parsebook. In turn, we could use the toItem method of the page object, and this simply returns the extracted item from the given page. We're storing that one in the item variable here. We're also passing or rather assigning the category name field that is passed into parse book here. Before trying to run this one, we need to fix out our imports. First, we don't need the book item inside the scrapey spider itself because this is moved into the page object. Next, we need to import the page object inside the scrapey spider. Now let's try to run it to see if it works. Now it's finished successfully without any errors. As you would see here, there's no error in the logs as mentioned. Let's check out the data output file again. There's nothing that has actually changed here. We're still extracting the 1000 books that we're expecting with the same fields that we've defined. The only thing that changed here is that the parse book method inside our scrapey spider doesn't contain any extraction logic at all. It doesn't know how to extract the fields for the book page itself. Instead, it's simply calling the page.toItem method. Now let's try to move the rest of the extraction logic that we see in this spider here uh, into their own respective page objects. So we have the home page here, we have the book page, and let's define their own page object classes for each one of them. First of all, we don't need to call the to item method. So we don't need to import or reuse the item web page that we used earlier. We're simply gonna be importing web page. This web page is different from item web page, wherein this doesn't contain any abstract method named to item that we need to implement. This is important because we're not really interested in extracting an actual item from the given web page. What we're really interested in is defining the properties or rather attributes for a given page. I'll try to show you what I mean. So what we've done here is move out the extraction logic that extracts the category URLs from the home page. So we've created a home page which inherits from the web page class, and we've defined a property method named category URLs, 
And if you try to check out the spider code in the right, we're importing the page object named homepage and defining that homepage in the parse method here. This means that when ScrapyPoet sees the parse method with the type annotation for its page parameter with homepage, it's simply going to provide the homepage instance for this given method. With that, we could simply use the category URLs property that we've defined earlier. Now for completeness, let's also create a page object for the category page here with its three extraction rules. As you would see on the right, our scrapey spider looks a lot more simpler because it doesn't contain any of the extraction logic we've defined. Instead, it's simply importing the page objects on the left and simply accessing the methods or properties for each page object. For example, for the book category page, we've defined a property of book URLs, category name, and next page URL. The parse category method is simply calling page.bookurl, page.categoryName, and page.nextPageURL. This makes maintaining your Scrapey project as it scales much, much more simpler. Later on, you would be encountering a lot of website changes. Um, so you need to create a, a lot more backup parser rules. That tends to pollute your spider code over time. For example, you would need to have five or 10 different parser rules for next page URL. Now when reading your scrapey code, that becomes a lot harder because of the multiple lines of code that you need to go through. Instead, if you just simply call page.nextURL, and have your page object contain the 10 different uh, parse rules, this makes your spider code much, much more easier to read. As you would see, we simply have the crawling logic here. From parse, it goes to parse category. From parse category, it goes to the parse book. This page object pattern also encourages uh, code reusability uh, in your organization. For example, there are different teams that want to crawl a particular website, but they're not really interested in writing the extraction logic again from scratch. What you could do is simply create a single page object definition for the given web page or website and simply use those page objects uh, inside your different types of spiders for different type of team in your organization. You might also find some page objects in open source where other developers have already defined parser rules inside page objects that is ready to be used by other developers as well. Now let's try to compare our scrapey spider code before and after we introduced the concept of page objects. On the left-hand side, you would see our much simpler scrapey code where it uses the page objects we've defined earlier. On the right, you would see that these earlier scrapey code before using page objects um, looks a lot more complex because it contains a lot of the extraction code. As your scrapey project scales, it's much simpler to maintain this type of code on the left, you're mostly focused on the crawling aspect of it rather than the extraction logic. If something goes wrong with your parsers, you could always try to go to your page object and debug it from there instead of mixing the crawling and extraction logics together in the same code. Now we've done a lot of work in improving our spider and I think it's ready to be prepped for production. 
First, we want to run our spiders on some sort of platform. So you'll need a way to manage and visualize uh, activities of your different runs. And if you wrote multiple spiders, you would actually manage each one of them. So different features are needed for protection. For example, the ability to schedule periodic runs, uh, check out which runs uh, have failed, which are successful. You need a way to go through all the items, the logs, the stats, visualize and debug errors, check out the performance and so on. Um, and I think one great open source package that you could check out is Spider Keeper. So you could check this one out. Uh, it's in GitHub and I think it's, it's really great. It has a, a ton of great features. You could also try to deploy this one on some sort of compute instance and manage your spiders from there. Alternatively, you could also use enterprise tools like Scrapey Cloud. So disclaimer, we use this one a lot in Zite and I could try to show you how it looks like. First, you need to install the shop dependency and try to log in and enter your API key. I've already done this first two steps, so I could just show you the third step of deploying our project in Scrapey Cloud. For this session, I took the liberty of creating a demo project in Scrapey Cloud. So what we're gonna do is copy the Scrapey Cloud project ID and try to deploy our spiders in this project. Now that it's finally deployed, we could try to run our spider. So we could do that by going to run and going to books and clicking run. So now we could see it's running. It doesn't have any items, requests yet. Um, I also took the liberty of running a, a spider earlier. So you could see that there's a thousand book items, which we expect. We could also see the requests that has been used for this crawl. We could also check out the logs. We could check out the stats and so on. Note that for Scrapey Cloud, you could run one free crawl at any given point in time. So you could check it out uh, if you're interested. Now, when running spiders in production, you may want to add some monitoring to it. I want to introduce this dependency called Spidermon. It has the ability to write custom monitors out there. It also has some out of the box monitors included. It also supports notifications via Slack, Telegram, Discord, email, and so on. Let's check out the out of the box monitors included linked here. As you would see, the out of the box monitors are stuff like item count monitor for checking if there's no items being extracted for a given job using this Spidermon min setting. Also an error count monitor, warning count monitor, finish reason, um, unwanted HTTP codes. I think you may want to use this one for some codes like 404. Maybe, you know, you don't want to waste resources by your spider crawling a lot of 404 pages. There are also some item validation monitors, some field coverage monitors. Some use cases for this one would be something like you're getting 80% coverage for, let's say, a title field but the next day it suddenly drops into 20%. So you may wanna try to check out the field coverage for you, all of your runs, because that could indicate that your extraction code is stale because of website changes. So this indicates that you need to update your extraction code very, very soon. To start using Spidermon, we wanna install it via pip install Spidermon. Now we want to open up our Scrapey Spider. And we want to add the settings needed for Spidermon. I'm using custom settings here as a class attribute uh, in our book Spider. You could also add these settings into the settings.py in our Scrapey project. But if you try to add any setting in this setting file, it would actually be enabled in all of the spiders in your project. 
The difference with custom settings inside the spider is that it's only enabled inside the spider it's defined. In this case, when we try to define the Spider-Man settings here, this only is enabled for this given spider. The first setting is trying to enable Spider-Man using this flag. The next one is adding Spider-Man as the extension for Scrapey. You can check this one in further detail by checking out the official docs linked in the slide. As you would see here, this is the first step for enabling Spider-Man. Next, you'd need to define the monitors. In this case, we're defining the spider close monitors, which is only run when the spider is about to be closed. This monitor is available out of the box, so you could also check out the official docs on what are the available actions or stuff it checks out. But for our code, I've already defined some of the setting that it needs, like the min items required for a given run. This means that if our run contains less than 10 items, an error or alert would be raised. I've also defined max errors as one, wherein if there's like 10 errors in our job, it would try to alert us. I've also defined max warnings here, wherein if there are more than a thousand warning logs, it would try to alert you. I've also defined field coverage here uh, that I've talked earlier. Just try to see between the different runs if some of our fields have dropped in coverage. Let's say the title dropped from 80% coverage to 20% coverage. To demonstrate Spider-Man, let's simulate a scenario wherein something has gone wrong somewhere in our spider code. For this, I'm raising a value error inside the parse category method just to simulate an exception that sometimes we may encounter. We could run our spider as usual. And after it's finished running, you would actually see the Spider-Man checks that is being executed here. If you would see the logs raised in a traceback regarding the value error we've simulated, and you would actually see the monitor here saying stuff like extracted item monitor failed because if you check out the configuration, we're requiring a minimum of 10 items for a given job. It also failed on the error count here because we've defined that the max errors should only be one and the rest are pretty much okay. I mentioned that Spider-Man supports notifications via Slack, Telegram, Discord, email, and so on. I wanted to show you a quick screenshot of what a notification in Spider-Man looks like in email. So here's a sample email you may want to check out wherein you've received um, one failed Spider-Man monitor uh, that you, you may define in your spider name demo. Uh, it contained 91 errors. It ran for like five minutes and one of the monitors has failed. And if you check out the summary of the monitors, the specific monitor that failed is that there are some errors raised uh, in your spider code. This is really useful when you try to scale your Scrapey project, wherein you may have hundreds or even thousands of jobs running for a given week, for a given day, and you would receive Spider-Man notifications like this one if something has gone wrong in some of your crawls. In combination with the Spider-Man notification and alerts we've discussed, you may also want to check out or add uh, schema validations in your item. For this slide, we're going to be checking out the Scrapey JSON schema package as linked here. It has the ability to write custom schema validations per item. This means that if something uh, has gone wrong or has been inserted in a given item, an error could pop out. In turn, Spider-Man could receive or notice this error and send you out an alert. For Scrapey JSON schema, it uses a JSON schema uh, to define the data format for each type of field in a given item. There's some small caveat on this though. It's not really compatible with the type of items we defined earlier using data classes. It's not also supported well in the address library, but that could be fixed really, really soon. But for now, let's try to define its own type of item that is not a data class. First, let's install Scrapey JSON schema and JSON schema using pip. 
Now that it's installed, uh, let's first define the items. If we recall earlier, we've defined the items using the data class. But for now, we're going to be using Scrapey JSON schema to define the items. So first, we want to import JSON schema item from Scrapey JSON schema. Here, I've pasted down the schema definition. And if you notice, we're defining the item using this attribute in JSON schema. It's just a key value pair of the item definition. So you can check out the official docs for Python's JSON schema on how this is defined. But the main difference that we could see between the data class item we've defined earlier versus this JSON schema item we've defined now is that we're not defining it via attributes uh, like URL, category name, title. The fields are actually defined underneath this properties key here. And each field could have its own type like string. Uh, for strings, you could define patterns like this one, you know, enforcing given string should have this regular expression. In this case, we're enforcing that it should begin with an HTTP or HTTPS and so on. Other validations for schema could include the minimum that a number could take here. One of the advantages for JSON schema is trying to define regular expressions for string and adding bounds for a given number. Now let's try to update our page object to use this new item, which we named book schema item instead of the old book item we defined earlier. So for now, I just commented out the old book item and replace it with book schema item. In our spider code, I'm also going to revert the changes that we've made for integrating Spidermon. And since we're using JSON schema items, uh, it doesn't have currently the ability to assign uh, field attributes. So we're going to be using uh, the dictionary format here. And then lastly, to enable uh, scrapey JSON schema validations in our spider code, we need to add it inside the custom settings. Now, I think we could run our code to see how it goes. Now it's finished. One thing to notice here is that we have an additional stats named JSON schema. And from this stat, we could infer that there's some error going on inside the price and there are a thousand items being affected by it. You'd also notice that these items have been dropped. So there's also a thousand of them being dropped. This is because by default, JSON schema drop items if it doesn't conform to any of the schema that we've defined. But you could easily change this behavior to just simply air it out instead of dropping it completely. But first, let's check out why this JSON schema error is here in the first place. If you recall, our, we defined our price field as a number with a minimum value of zero. But if you also recall, we're not extracting price as simply a number. We're extracting it as a string where it contains the pound key inside. So checking out our data set collected from before, uh, we could see that there's a pound key here represented by this Unicode substring. So in order to pass this, we just need to update our spider code to simply extract the price value numerically and simply ignore the pound sign. Now, from this quick example, I hope you could see the power that schema validations add to your arsenal of scrapey tools uh, in this whole ecosystem. As your scrapey project grows, it's important to add schema validations in each of the item types that you're trying to extract. This could rule out any potential issues that may arise via regression. For example, you fix some field, but then you know, you're not extracting it properly. In this case, Scrapey JSON schema is able to catch that a given item is not conforming to the actual schema that we're expecting.
Another thing you want to consider when productionizing your spiders is the behavior of exporting data sets. Out of the box, Scrapey supports FTP, S3, GCS. So I've linked out the official doc governing those uh, use cases here. But there are also other plugins available to support, you know, other data storage like Azure Storage, Google Drive, Snowflake, BigQuery, and so on. Alternatively, you could also write down your own plugin to support some of your custom data integrations, maybe to PostgreSQL, uh, MongoDB, and so on. Next, I want to discuss handling special cases. I want to discuss handling JavaScript in web pages, uh, which is now pretty much prevalent because a lot of the web pages or websites we want to crawl uh, uses uh, single page application frameworks like React. Uh, so we need to handle those JavaScript. For this section, I want to introduce another type of demo web page named quotes.toscrape.com.js, which needs JavaScript to run uh, in order to render its uh, page elements correctly. Now, this is how the website looks like. It looks like any plain old uh, website that we see, but if we try to extract the page elements here using Scrapey, we're not able to because it's not rendered yet via JavaScript. By default, Scrapey doesn't use JavaScript, so it's just able to utilize the HTTP response from the response request pair. In order to run JavaScript, we could use packages like Playwright, uh, which conveniently also has a neat Scrapey Playwright package available. You're able to set it up using these commands right here. I've already set them up in my machine, so we could test it out directly. First, let's create a new spider using the scrapey gen spider command. After running it, we could verify that this template spider is created, as we could see here. And now let's try to open it up. Uh, we need to update the start URL to have slash JS to indicate we want the JavaScript version for the demo site. First, we want to remove start URLs because we're going to be overriding the default start requests, which feed off the start URLs because we need to pass a flag. So we're going to be defining HTTP. This flag is named meta equals playwright true. This means that for this particular scrapey request, we want to enable playwright for it. And in order to use Playwright in our Scrapey Spider, we need to add it inside the custom settings here. We could try to see if we'd actually configure this correctly by checking out the official docs of Scrapey Playwright. As with any other Scrapey package that we've explored in this talk, you could always try to check out GitHub for the official package documentation to see all of the flags are available settings for the given package. For Scrapey Playwright, you would see that we need to update the download handlers in the settings, as well as Twisted Reactor. We already defined that one here. We could also see that one of the basic usage for Scrapey Playwright is updating the meta flag, or rather meta key, Playwright equals true. And we've also defined it here. The remaining thing to do here is trying to create the extraction rules for this given website. Now suppose we want to extract just the quotes here. This one and to this one. So there would be 10 of them. To do that, we need to create the rule here. So it's going to be a div with class quote. And the text that we are interested in is inside a span with a class of text. Now let's try to run it. And let's check out the data output file. And as you can see here, we've successfully extracted the quotes. And now let's suppose Let's start from scratch and just quickly demo what happens if we don't have Scrapey Playwright installed. So let's just comment out the, the custom settings here. 
So as you can see, there are zero items extracted. We could confirm it via the stats here. We could also check out the data output file. So you would see there's like zero items extracted. Now, if we try to check out the logs for the time where we enabled Scrapey Playwright, we'd actually see that it's running the browser underneath. So in this case, it's, it's using a Chromium as our browser. And it's able to download all of the assets for the given web page. This includes the CSS files, JS files, and so on, as well as the fonts. And after rendering the page, we are able to extract each item from the given page. More and more websites try to use JavaScript uh, when rendering their contents. Another alternative for not using Playwright is that just simply injecting the JSON data inside the raw response. This is because sometimes websites pretty much return the raw data before they're actually rendered via JavaScript. So you may also want to check that. Another alternative is to try to check out any public endpoints in a given website. Uh, if they're calling any specific uh, public APIs to retrieve the contents from, and you may want to use that one in so rendering the website completely using Chromium or any other browser emulation that Playwright uses. One caveat in using browser emulation like this one is that it's really resource intensive. So you may want to check out, as I mentioned, any JSON data inside the raw response, as well as checking out any public endpoints that contains the data that you need. Now, what we've discussed so far are a lot of the packages surrounding Scrapey, as well as Scrapey itself. So with those packages and framework, you're pretty much good to go with crawling and extraction data from the web. But I also want to touch upon, like really, really go through quickly some of the various helpful libraries that you might find useful because they could make your Scrapey project or crawling project much, much easier. The first one is helpers for parsing numbers. So this is very useful when websites try to spell out numbers and you may want to easily parse them. For example, if a website spells out the year like 2020, it could easily parse it to a number like this one. Uh, it doesn't also error out if a given string doesn't have a number like this. Um, it's also able to parse a couple of sentences in different languages, like here in Spanish. It's also able to determine numbers in a given sentence. For example, I have two hats and, you know, two is converted into numerical two in this case. The next one is quite related to the number parser, but this one is for price. So it's more specialized for parsing um, numbers from prices. So for example, if you extract this text right here from a given CSS rule, it's able to separate the currency away from the amount here. You're also able to access it via attributes like currency, amount text, uh, amount float, uh, and so on. So it's really, really useful for those specialized cases. Another one is for parsing dates. So the first one is date parsers. So it's able to parse dates and return them by uh, Python's date time instance. So for example, given this string, it's able to return and parse it correctly here. Also able to support different types of format, uh, like without time, just dates. It's also able to parse relative time formats like this one. So for example, if today is the 1st of August, 2020, it's able to pass uh, what is the actual date two months from that one. It's also able to parse timestamps uh, like Unix timestamps from Epoch into the actual date. Another alternative for this one is my, you may want to check it out because it contains other features uh, that might not be present in date parser. Another one is for retrieving HTML metadata. Uh, this one is called extract. So if you try to notice some of the, you know, OG image meta tags, for example, in PyCon APAC 2022, if you send out this link in Slack, you would receive this OG image, right? So this OG image is actually present inside the uh, metadata, inside the page. 
So you would see here it's OG image. So extract is able to retrieve other types of, or many types of metadata for HTML, like JSON LD, open graph, microformat, and so on. If you're interested in parsing those types of data, you may want to check out extract. Next up is HTML text. So it's the ability to extract text from nested HTML tags. If you remember our earlier example for the availability, wherein you know we need to process it a bit because the text we want to extract was after a given child node. So in this case, we could have avoided that one easily by using HTML extract. For our specific use case, we could have used it something like this one. So for example, if we just want to extract a hello world, uh, we could just parse it like this one instead of adding a lot of pre-processing steps to actually extract hello world. Next, I also want to quickly introduce you to some of the advanced use cases in, in crawling to complement the stuff we've discussed here earlier. First, there's this technique named Delta Fetch, and there's already a package for this one in Scrapey called Scrapey Delta Fetch. The use case for this one is that if you need to retrieve only the new items in a given website, it's able to do that one. Earlier, we've explored the website named books.toscript.com. For example, that website releases new books every month or so. If you want to keep a given database up to date for all of the books available in a given website, it might be less resource intensive for you if you're only able to extract books that you've not seen previously. This decreases the the amount of time it takes to crawl, making it more efficient, consuming less requests, uh, resources, and so on. So yeah, just check it out if you have a use case specific to this one. Another use case is you want to treat a scrapey spider as an API. Like for example, uh, you want to have an on-demand API for extracting books. So you just send it this URL like this one and, and call the API and the API itself would run the spider and return the items for you. As a bonus, it also includes other stats like what are the items dropped here, some stats, some status in the spider, and so on. So this is a much more compelling option if you wanna avoid the command line interface altogether and just simply create an API around your spider. You could also host it on a dedicated server or machine. So in our earlier example for books.toscrape.com, we were writing the parser rule to actually find the next link to the next page. For this case, the auto pager is able to determine the next page by inferring the URL for this given button right here. So the quick use case for this one would be like this. So as you can see, we'd requested uh, auto pager here. Uh, with the given HTML page and it returned the link to the next page for page two. The caveat here is you may want to also retrain the model um, if there's some new type of web pages you want to use this for. Next up are enterprise tools. So for ML-based extraction, there's auto extract. The use case for this one is that you might not have the time to write crawlers and parsers, especially if you want to crawl thousands and thousands of websites. That means, you know, writing thousand parsers for different uh, websites from scratch. Also, if you don't know the websites you'd be crawling beforehand, you know, you just want to extract data on demand, you could just use this. So this enterprise tool uses machine learning behind the scenes where it's able to extract the given data for any type of web page. In my example below, we're extracting books from books.toscrape.com and this particular book by this given URL, uh, we're assigning it a page type of product and calling the API in this format. And this API call would result in this one. So if you could see, it's able to check out the name of the book, the description, the image, uh, URL, UPC, product type, uh, the price, and so on. So this is really useful if you really don't have the time to write your own parsers. So this would be moved to Zite API soon, which is this next one. So Zite API is just an all-in-one solution with proxy rotations, with custom locations. You could crawl from the US, uh, Spain. It has headless browsers. If you don't need browsers, it could also run with browsers with full emulation and page interactions. Uh, this means you could click on an element, hover an element, move your mouse here and there, or click on a pop-up or something. It's also able to extract screenshots 
And of course, later this year, it's going to be including ML-based data extraction. And as I mentioned earlier, Scrapey Cloud is also an option for Scrapey Spider hosting. Um, so it supports on-demand scaling. Like if you need to only run 10,000 jobs right now per day, and later on you would decide you would need 1,000 jobs per day, it's able to you know, scale up depending on your needs. It has also built in monitoring tools and API capabilities to determine your data sets. If you want to download the data or get the stats or the logs, and you know, it's able to integrate across different types of use cases. So I might've missed out on some other tools out there that is really unique to your use case. So be sure to check out lists like this one because it contains a lot of different tools regarding to scrapey, crawling, and data extraction in general. Um, and yeah, that's it for my presentation. And I also want to put it out there that Zite is in the lookout for Python crawl developers. So please feel free to check out this link here. And lastly, we're also hosting the Web Data Extract Summit this September 29th this year. So check out this link here if you want to learn more. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day here at PyCon.